Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to manage vets consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of The Bend. My name is Debbie Boone, and I am your host. And today we have Renee Michelle, uh, who is a nationally recognized motivational speaker. She is the co-founder of Get Motivated, LLC, a company that provides well-being solutions for veterinary professionals and organizations. She is a certified yoga teacher, a highly regarded certified professional coach, and she has experienced coaching veterinary professionals including but not limited to veterinarians, practice managers, and various hospital support staff. She spent over 17 years in the veterinary industry as a team leader and a veterinary assistant. So let's talk to Renee about how she plans to change the world of veterinary medicine. Thank you very much for being with us today, Renee. Thank you, Debbie. That was a fantastic uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. You could encapsulate a lot of those big milestones that I've enjoyed over the years and happy to get into this conversation and talk with your people, your audience, your listeners. Thank you. you. Well, I always like to ask the origin story. How did you get started in vet med? What possessed you to walk into a hospital and say, "Um, can I have a job? Yeah, you know, I was 15, 16 years old, and I I can't recall whether or not it was all me or if it was, if I had some parental involvement there <laughs> because I was so young, but I started out in kennels. I worked, you know, three hours a day after school, four hours on our late night, and from there, we're talking, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, really going to date myself there, but it was more of an apprenticeship. And so I started out in kennels. I stayed there for a while. And then I moved into reception and then into rooms. I began to lead the next boarding kennel team. And after that, I went into surgery and treatment and then started to lead the rooms and so I've been in nearly every place in a general practice clinic. Um, and then I just really settled in with vet assistant and team leadership. But I've I've always been cross-trained in these different areas. And I've always had an affinity for the front office. I love loved that role and um, still do. I think it's such an important part of our clinics. But um, so that's where I got into vet med and it's also, I spent 11 years at my first clinic and that is where I really got to the point where I was struggling with my mental health and my physical health. And I was lucky enough to not just have great leaders who taught me how to be a veterinary professional and a team leader, but supported me in this human journey. They cared about me as a person first and as a veterinary professional second, right? And so I think of Get Motivated and what I look to the vet industry in doing is sort of rehumanizing our industry. So um, I struggled for a couple of years. I did all of the things that any good type A'er would do, right? Go to the doctors, go to the specialist, take, you know, this, um, this course of, treatment, do this course of treatment. And I wasn't really getting results. I found myself doing all of the things and not having success. And in fact, was getting more diagnosis piled on. And then I was going for more tests that were coming back negative. And at some point after 
being diagnosed with anxiety and depression and having suicidal ideation and being an insomniac and having these secondary flare-ups that would happen when I would get particularly stressed, I, I said, enough is enough. I cannot, I mean, we're talking early 20s. I was not going to lead my entire life this way. And I knew that I didn't know exactly what I was aiming for. And I didn't exactly know how I was going to get there, but I knew I was a capable person and happy and sort of the opposite of everything that I was experiencing was the first dart that I threw at the dartboard. Mm -hmm. And slowly but surely, I'd say over the next three to four years, I would be able to replace medications with different coping tools. Um, this is the dawn of the internet. So the topics were not mainstream. They certainly weren't in vet med. And I was growing up in Detroit, Metro Michigan. So there weren't a lot of places to go to for these at the time were what considered alternative methodologies to leading a, an op, you know, a, an optimized life of well-being. And once I put my well-being at the forefront of everything that I did, I was able to come off of the medications. I was able to stop seeing the doctors every other day um, and get to a place where I felt I had an identity that wasn't those things that clouded me. Um, I later moved to North Carolina and that's where I worked with Dr. Holly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people ask us about how Get Motivated started and how we work together, but we landed, uh, a lot of things happened at that time. You know, um, I found myself even getting a divorce and, and owning a home and transitioning these, these life chapters. But Dr. Holly and I worked at the same clinic and we recognized that we operated very similar to each other, which was sometimes different than the rest of the people that we <laughs> Right. Uh -huh. Sometimes like you're kind of weird for some of this stuff, but we got to talking and we began working out on the soccer field near our clinic. So not, but five minutes away, we would go out during lunchtime. We would work out, exercise, run hills, attempted to have him do yoga with me, but we did yoga pretty successfully a few times. And we would talk about the strategies and tools that we used and how we could help other people because we were no longer the anomaly at that point in time. You know, we're flash forwarding to um, 2015, 2016, those times. And so by that point in vet med, we were the majority. Mm -hmm. And by we, I mean people who struggled with burnout, compassion fatigue, these other psychological distressors. And we thought we would write a book, but very quickly, within about six months, we formed the uh, the organization and sought out speaker training. We sought out professional coaching certifications to really shift to caring for the caregivers because we recognized that A, there was that need, B, that we could potentially meet that need with solutions, and then C, I can only have my hands on, we'll say 20 being generous plus patients in a day, interact with 20 plus patients, families, their pet parents. So I can, that's my impact, right? It's limited. Mm -hmm. But if we can help the caregiver, then that is a little bit more scalable. And now we're impacting the lives of these pets and their pet parents in a way that is, it's that ripple effect. And so at the, at the heart of the mission, there's the quality of life for pets, but it's met by addressing the quality of life for us as humans. Mm -hmm. And that was a complete switch in the caregiver, we'll say conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, we, but we were committed. We're going to revolutionize that med because we believe that it's possible because we've seen it happen, not just with ourselves, but with other people and slowly, but surely very organically started to come up with different services and, um, ways to meet, we'll say the market, um, mm -hmm. what our people, what our community members needed. 
Yeah. You know, I, I love that. I love what you said that because I've thought the exact same thing years ago when I started my consulting practice, consolidation was just beginning. And um, a, a doctor that I used to work with years ago was involved in it. And he said, come and work with us and manage practices. And I said, no, first of all, I've been there and done that and I don't want to do it again. But the other thing is, how do you impact the greatest number of people? And so I feel like for me, it is speaking and writing and training and having uh, an outreach to a multitude of clinics and caregivers, as you said, and teaching them how to navigate the waters. And, you know, it was funny because when I kind of grew up in practice, you're right. I started working in a hospital in 1985. Uh, I actually started long before that at 15, <clears throat> just as a volunteer. It was a simpler world. I mean, first of all, medicine was simpler, so it was not as expensive or complex. And people had a different attitude about their animals. So there was not that huge emotional toll that you have now. Because, I, I mean, I can tell you, honestly, I have had people look at me and go, well, I'm not spending money on that. I'll just take him home and shoot him. And of course, a lot of that is to get a rise. And I said, well, yeah, I understand that. And it's it's your prerogative to do that. But then you wouldn't have come here if that's what you wanted to do, right? And so he went, no, I said, okay. So we moved on with the conversation. So it is, it is definitely a, a, a shift in the place the animal has in the home. Um, years ago, Dr. Sharon Barnett um, used to do a lot of, you know some speaking and stuff in our practice and she worked for Novartis. She's the one who developed monthly flea products. And I said, Sharon, you realize you changed the face of veterinary medicine because when animals could come into the home, then people decided that they really liked these animals and they they changed places. Instead of being the outside yard dog with the fleas, they were in the bed and that changed the world. So it was a huge culture shift too. And I think that made it harder for people who work in vet med to manage the emotion of the clients and their own emotion, because then the people who are younger coming into the profession were not coming from farm background where you ate what you grew, right? So it's a, it's a big difference in what was what it was then and what it was now. So I'm curious, and I love the fact that you said I got off the medications, because one of my firm beliefs is that once we know ourselves, once we understand self-talk, what our mind is doing to us, uh, I'm actually giving a talk at AVMA called Your Brain is a Liar and Why That Matters. Mm -hmm. uh, because once we understand that that's happening, we can stop it. We can cut that off. We can say, that's not true. Let me pull my smart brain out and not let my limbic brain take over. And I can have self-talk that changes the narrative for me. So I love, I love that you said that. So tell me in, in all those things, I mean, obviously moving divorce, what's been your toughest life challenge and how did you mentally move through that? There's big times in my life, but when I started to do this inner work, I recognize, you know, Heraclitus has this saying that change is the only constant. Mm -hmm. And I think I found that along the way, sometime between I was going through stress management and anger management <laughs> and this was, um, but it was such a liberating thing because it shifted the ownership of my current state of the circumstances, right? We have that. If we're going to talk psychologically, you have that external locus of control versus yeah. your internal locus of control. And so it shifts the things that are changing to what you can own and that is our responses and again as I started to unfold these tools and sink into one of my favorites which is mindfulness-based stress reduction and blend a lot of these resources that I think was really key for me was that it's a blend and the holistic or the whole person view was what I was lacking. And so I think my biggest challenge is that there is an internal turbulence that even with the tools wants to creep up. 
And I recognize that not everyone has that. And I aspire and I, I almost admire that, um, that ability. But when we are speaking with, I think in vet med, the majority of people who don't have that naturally there, you have a sense of like the people who come into vet med are particularly more attached to animals. Mm -hmm. And so again, the narrative there is that we want that relationship with animals. And even now with the human animal bond, we fail to recognize that there's a human attached. Yes. And so in order to do your job well, you need to increase your skills of communication with humans. But also like you mentioned, I want to pull out what you mentioned, which is recognizing your own emotions and potentially triggers that would escalate a situation rather than not just de-escalate it, but provide a positive outcome for the patient. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we lose when we don't communicate well. And when we aren't paying paying close enough attention to um, the patterns, right? Because that's not the only guy that said that to you in your career. Oh, no. That's the conversation people will have thousands of time. And sometimes it'll be the exact same conversation. Sometimes it'll be the same situation, but it shows up in a little bit different way, right? He's wearing different pants, you know, the situation's wearing different pants that day. Yes. Your reactions and stuff. And so when we can do that, we're able to provide better care. But again, it's because we are managing our state of being. And so the divorce was challenging. The more that I look at my inner work, I've had certain times through childhood that is challenging. Running a business, being an entrepreneur is challenging. Being a bonus mom is challenging. I was a bonus mom for years before I was a bio mom. And before I was a bonus mom, I probably wouldn't have used that language, but because I am, I have that language there. Um, and so there's, there's lots of different seasons and I know that it's not over. No, not no, over. no that, that's just it. You know, it's, it's, I think there's an unrealistic expectation of being happy and that, that there is, there's mountains and valleys, mountains and valleys. And I can remember my niece got married and I was directing her wedding and I gave a toast at the rehearsal dinner. And I said, please understand that there will be times in your marriage that you can't stand each other. And there will be times when you fall in love again, but you have to go to the valley in order to appreciate the, the mountaintop. Mm -hmm. So you, you really have to say, okay, here I am looking back on that valley. Then that was really hard and, and own it that it was hard, but also go, wow. And look what came out of it. Look how I moved through it. And you can be proud of yourself for moving through these really hard times and, and recognizing that they, they're tough, but that they didn't beat you. You know, you still, you, you triumph through it. You, you came through and you'll do it again and again and again, because that's life. That's the way it rolls. And, and you, uh, yeah. There's that really great, there's a great saying I saw and it's um that, gosh, I, um it's something like, you know, I don't know what the next chapter is, but I trust the author. Yes. And, and that is where, when I, I remember sitting out or standing in my backyard during the time when I was going through the, the divorce. And it was, it was probably in like the top 1% of like amicable divorces. Like we were, we knew each other for 10 years before we got married. Still civil now, great relationship. It's just, we, you know, it, a recipe of things. It just wasn't right. I remember thinking that I don't know how to do this. This is uncharted territory, but again, I can figure this out. Mm -hmm. I can figure this out. And that's the choice that we make. And when you think about happiness, sometimes we have to choose happy and we have to be able to recognize that there is a choice. And, you know, um, <laughs> Michelle Obama, that's, I love, you know, she says when we go high, when, or when they go low, we go high, mm -hmm. right? And I've been listening a lot to her lately because she's said the same thing about marriages is that, you know, there's times where 
I have 10 years where you don't really enjoy your spouse. Um, but she would take that bet to have the 30 years. Mm -hmm. Um, that that is again, when we're not sharing stories with the strategies, we fail to see the truth behind things. And so when I'm looking for truth Mm -hmm. and strategies and what resonates with me, and I know that there's going to be times where this set of tools works better for me than the other set. I know that I am no longer my thoughts. I am simply having thoughts. But when you talk about your brain as a 20 year old, there was not a differentiation between my mind and my brain or who I am at myself core and my brain. And so again, we over identify not just with our thoughts, but sometimes with our jobs. And if it serves you, then it's not a problem. If you like my, my fiance, he will say bleeds orange. That means that he is KTM motocross rider, dirt bike rider for life. It is who he is. And that serves him really well. But as veterinary professionals, if you are overly identifying with your career, you lose your sense of self. And if you're getting into a place where you're struggling, you have to step back and figure out who you are as a human before we start to solve who we are as veterinary professionals. And just that mantra alone can be really helpful to shift you out of those places of what we call pseudo well being or like where the situation is good. And yet you're, you know, you're just happens by ham- happenstance doing well. Or if you're in a place of contrast, if you're in that valley, like I was in my early years, if you're if you're in that place of valley and you're in contrast where you're you don't you, you're experiencing something that you don't want, leverage that to get to what you do want. Mm-hmm. That's where the mindfulness comes in is having a sense of awareness and you become the witness rather than entangled or attached to these things, these beliefs that do not serve us. And in fact, it leads us to deep suffering. And that is the, that's the practice. That is a, you know, you're not going to shower, you know, you're not going to shower once and be clean for life. You're not going to do some of these things and never have to do them again. You're going to have some things that are really proactive to where you set up your life to be optimized and to be somewhat automated and they get, you get ritualistic with your habits. And then there's going to be some things that you tap into because you are overwhelmed Mm -hmm. because you are experiencing the full range of human emotions rather than just escaping them because they're uncomfortable and you don't know how to sit with them and you don't know how to navigate through them. And that's sometimes where you do need a professional. Mm -hmm. You need someone licensed in like mental health, um, to help you because you sometimes there's some d- gremlins that mm-hmm. that you know if you if you open that door if you let someone out of their we'll say out of their cage or if someone comes knocking on your door burnout or um depression or something like that trauma things like that you need someone to help you navigate that um so that you don't get into an even worse place but like bring you out of that valley well i think you're talking about the mind, of course, is always looking, it lives for fear, right? And and we look for negativity. We have a negativity bias because our limbic brain is designed to keep us safe, uh, eating and reproducing. That's basically its joy. It's joy. <laughs> but the if we if we learn to recognize when it's starting to take us down a bad path, and we say, okay, let me stop, let me take four deep breaths and then engage the smart part of my brain. And this is even when I'm coaching communication, talking about the front desk and challenges with difficult clients. It is, it is being able to disengage from conflict by pulling yourself sort of mentally away from that and looking down on it and then diagnosing the situation going, why is this person fearful why is their limbic brain kicking in? And then how can I 
manage that because that's the emotional intelligence of part of of people skills is being able to manage somebody else's emotion too rather than feeding into it and exacerbating things and i really feel like a lot of <laughs> the drama and difficulty that happened during covid and it still happens today we actually brought on ourselves because we didn't recognize our own distress mm-hmm. and our remarks back and our you know i laughed and said when you are working so hard that you don't have time to pee or eat or take any kind of a break, then your mind has gone into, oh my God, she's in famine and I've got to conserve energy. And so I cannot expend any energy on anything other than moving through this task. And we forget that we need to be nice. We don't take the time, the energy, this, oh no, that's extra stuff. So we really do need to to set those boundaries that say, I I eat, I drink, I pee. I really do those things because otherwise I can't do my work well. And I, it's something that I have taught for years. And I think growing up in a practice, my practice owner was um, a high driver personality, but extremely disciplined. And so we set appointments. We went to lunch. We had a two hour break over lunch. We came back and at night we went home. And this was you know, I and mean, even if he came back to the clinic to work at 630, he walked out the door, went home, ate dinner and came back. So it was a, a boundary that was set. So when I got out into the world and I started working with other clinics and I thought, you guys are a hot mess. This you don't know that you really can organize yourselves. You, it, This is a possibility. You really can do this, but they don't see how it's possible. And then they get down a bad path and, and it's hard to pull it back. Once you've let the floodgates open, right? Once you've accommodated all this stuff. Um, I can remember in both of my practices when I was managing, when I started working for them, they did not take appointments. So it was Katie bar the door. Everything just poured in all the time. And I finally convinced my first boss that we needed to take appointments. And he just was so afraid that animals would get well before they would come into the hospital. That was what he said. They'll get well before they come in. I went, that's not going to happen. But it takes a year to train the clients to be organized, right? And I did the same thing again when I moved to the next hospital and it has 11 veterinarians. So it was also walked in with 11 doctors. Now, four of them were large animal and they were out on the road, but still, can you imagine? Um, so you, you know, you have to retrain your clients, but then they they like it better because they're not sitting there for two hours waiting on a Saturday afternoon. Um, But those are all the kind of boundaries that we can set that we don't believe that we can. So it is, it is again, going back to self-talk, as you said, saying I can set boundaries. Now the challenge that I have with some people who set boundaries is that there's no leniency, that there's no, they set these boundaries and they're so hard that, even though there is a really valid reason that you should, okay, relax for a minute, <laughs> they can't do that. It's like they've set some rule that they can't do that. I, I had a talk with uh, Kim Pope Robinson and I said, you know, this is kind of like this work-life balance thing that says I have to do these three things in order to balance these three things. And I said, sometimes life doesn't work. Th- life is messy. And sometimes you're going to spend 12 hours doing something, but then two days later, you're going to spend 12 hours doing nothing. And that's perfectly all right. So that's where the balance, it's not that you have to to have these restrictions and rules that you have to follow, you know, just relax, (laughs) just relax. You know, and I'm going to kind of work backward from that a little bit. You know, the Dow, um, without putting like stuff in there, but So I've read, you know, there's a philosopher, um, an Eastern philosopher, and he has a a book and it talks about, there's this one chapter there. It's a, it's a really great book for daily reading, but there's a time for rest and there's a time for play. There's a time for worry. There's a time for relaxation, like all of those things. But again, these are, that's a little like the Beatitudes, right? Yeah. Like these are gems though, that I've only more recently discover within the past five years or so, but because I'm on the path, that's where I get to find these gems that help me. 
But that notion and that practice is very different. And that's when we look to society and our culture and then within the industry. But again, recognizing that well-being is not just holistic, but it has to be personalized Mm -hmm. and it has to be customized to where you're at right now, where I'm at for the like month to month, week to week, day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. I can promise you that the people who live with me know that Renee is a different type of person, (laughs) right? How she operates is different. And, and that's where you have to flex. You have to ride the, the water. You have to be like water to be able to ride the ebb and flows of life. And I'm not saying that it's easy. Like I told you, when we first started this call, I'm having a bit of a week. We've had um, things that are outside of our control happen and it throws off the week, but you ride the wave, you tap into the things that you know work, um, you reach for the other stuff. And boundaries are designed, I believe, to create connection. Boundaries are not the immature, we'll say, um, pre-adolescent or like even teenage young adult mind of this is a wall. This is who I am. Take yes. it or leave it. Yeah. That is not a boundary. That is going to create this connection boundaries are designed to create connection and to create a level of responsibility and freedom, but boundaries can be renegotiated. If you're traveling or if you have a broken leg and mowing the lawn is your job, communicate with another human. It can be someone that you live with, or it could be that you hire a service temporarily. It doesn't have to be that, well, this is my job for the rest of my life until I go. No, down. I just need to do it for this week, right? I understand that it's my job to clean out the kennels, but it's 559. So either we both can stay here or you can help, right? Like I'm kind of, I have a little bit of a sarcastic tone to my voice. I don't recommend boundaries with that tone because that's not going to get you somewhere, but I want to emphasize what your brain is probably having this conversation. And so when we do have those we have to, again, impress mindfulness of non-judgment, like you said, with the clients, but also with ourselves. If we're, if we are overwhelmed, girl, it is okay. It is okay. Compassion. By practicing mindfulness, we increase our emotional availability. We increase our ability to be compassionate. So those finite resources energy, mental bandwidth, mental real estate. The reason why we're forgetting things is because we're so driven. But when we free that up, the compassion doesn't just go out. The emotional availability or regulation doesn't just go out to other people. You can turn it toward yourself. And when we recognize that sometimes people or situations are mirroring things, we understand that once we put that oxygen mask on, once we're compassionate and we're nice to ourselves, and we're, we give ourselves permission to go pee, we <laughs> practice permission. We practice permission to advocate for ourselves. Excuse me, Dr. So-and-so, I need to go to the, like, I need to go to the laboratory. I need to go to the bathroom. I need to relieve myself. I need to get a drink of water. Um, you know, I, when I would interview for places, it was part of my interview question of whether or not I can snack throughout the day, like a gerbil and not, you know, once every 17 hours, like mm-hmm. I can't operate like that. Yeah. If I can't keep granola bars in my pockets, then this is not the place for me. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, those are the things oh. you give yourself permission to do those bigger things by practicing the little things, but you do it through that compassionate mind, you can do it by being nice. You can do it by having some fun. So when you are in those places where, wow, we've got five minutes. All right. You know, instead of, and, and don't get me wrong here. Like I was raised on the, if there's time to lean, there's time to clean. clean. (laughs) I think a lot of us were raised on that notion. I get that. But if I just ran a marathon, Nene is going to breathe. Uh-huh. Going to breathe. We've got some time everyone gets to breathe. However, that breathing looks for you. You want to go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. You want to eat, you want to eat. You want to go outside and see the sunshine? 
go outside and see the sunshine, take your shoes off. I was just talking with one of our GBMU students and she talked about how she loves taking her shoes off. I was like, oh, me too. I would take my shoes off any chance I got when I came home from work in the middle of the day. If I had a minute, I don't know what it is. Obviously, we're not really grounding when we're inside, but maybe it is a way to ground. Just it's something. Figure out your thing. Give yourself permission to do that. And and that organically gives other people the permission to do that. It's like taking off your bra when you get home, right? It's like, uh, you know, I don't have to do anything anymore. I don't have to go out into the world. I can relax. And this is my taking it down, just taking it down and relaxing. <laughs> Like something new, right? Like you talked about with COVID and stuff. If it's something new that you're trying on, right? Like if we're thinking about trying on clothes, if you're going to try on a boundary or try on some permission or self-compassion or whatever, non-judgment, try something on, see how it feels. COVID, I think it propelled, like it launched vet med into the future, which I think was a really great thing for us to begin leveraging technology in a new way. And it helped people see that, oh, we can make money, even though we're doing it differently. And some clinics were making so much money. And now what did we learn from COVID? Over 3 million pets were adopted. The HABA bond got strengthened, what everyone was asking for. And, but again, what comes like, there is opportunity there. And I believe like something for Get Motivated, again, and when we look at the pets, the horizon is, is that, yes, we will eventually, and it will happen now through like small segments of, we'll say early adopters, but eventually we will retrain our clients mm -hmm. to value our team's well-being because they see the value. They understand, they, they might not have the vocabulary to communicate it and say, well, gee, every time I come in here, every time I call, it feels good. Right. It's smooth. You guys are easy to work with. I enjoy your company. I enjoy having a conversation with you. you I feel educated. I feel empowered. They might not say those things, right? They might, but they choose you time and time again, and they're not upset if they have to wait or something like that. Um, but again, it's through us communicating so that they understand why, that they see why. And I don't just mean like they hear it, they've got to feel it. They have to feel like they understand. And that comes from, again, as clients, as pet parents, we hear them, we see them, they feel seen and heard. They feel like they matter. Um, it's been a long time since I've had to be, we'll say, in that pet parent role because I'm a vet professional. And But just recently, my kitty, she needed an ultrasound. And I was, you know, my ultrasound options are limited. And so here I am trying to figure out where it is that I want to take her. And I, I get the call and... I went into, I sprung into action possibly sooner than I needed to. Um, but it was like emotion. Here's what the lab work revealed. Get on the phone. I got to experience some of those conversations of how people talk to me. I mean, they don't know. And that's like, they don't, you don't know what someone knows. Right. Unless you are listening, unless you are asking them questions. If you're just talking at someone I mean, and so I had multiple conversations, two of which I felt really welcomed and like, again, like they don't know, like I felt like they were treating me the way that I would want to be treated as a, a, a family member, as a pet parent. And then I had one that was not, and, and it wasn't, for me, it was twofold, right? It was as that pet parent, but then all of them, like, I know things about vet med you know so yeah. you know, right? yeah. like I need for you to understand that this case is different and so by looking to our policies and procedures it's not just that you're not going to have a client but but like you're not things are guidelines 
Boundaries are guidelines. Mindfulness is a guideline. Every single tool that you encounter and use, your devices, nothing is a hard and fast rule. And we get ourselves into trouble when we treat things as such, including relationships, right? Not with relationships with other people or relationships like our, not relationships, plural, but your relationship with yourself and to be able to have some flexibility there. And and like I said, I know that what you and I are talking about, even as people who have the vocabulary, who have the skills to practice, it's not always easy, right, Debbie? No, it's not. I mean, you, there's many a time when somebody will say something to me. Well, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. So I got a new dog right before Christmas and he was at that time about 15 months old he was a retired show dog so he hadn't been neutered so I made an appointment with the new veterinarian I've never seen before because I haven't had a dog since I've lived here and uh, went for an AHA accredited hospital good reputation so I go into the hospital and um, I talk to them about neutering the dog uh, I had a I had an okay experience you know i And I gave them a three-star review, which the practice manager then called. And I said, look, I understand that my view of this stuff is different than most people, but here's some of the things that happened to me. And she was like, oh my God. I said, so I'm, I'm an outside observer. So I've just given you a free consultation, right? Because I want my experience to be better. But I called back because while he was neutered, I wanted to have his teeth clean. And the girl calls me back and says, um, Well, the technician said they might not need cleaning because he's so young. And immediately I flew hot because I thought, you know, I asked for this. I didn't come from a place of not no knowledge. And then I thought, no, she doesn't know who I am. She doesn't know my background. Calm down. And I said, no, I I want his teeth clean. The doctor has seen them. I am not one of those people who waits until their dog's teeth is rotting out of their head to clean them. I want them cleaned and I want them cleaned every year from now on. So um, we, you know, we got that hurdle, but I thought, why are you trying to talk me out of this? This is insane, right? That's the first thing that I said. But that, that the little flash moment, it just pissed me off because I thought, why would you question my judgment? You know, I know because when I went into the, <laughs> this is what I went into and I was trying to keep incognito, right? Mm-hmm. And I went into the exam room and the veterinarian came in and she goes, um, I know who you are. And I went, crap. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or not, but okay. But, you know, you were talking about uh, talking to people and being at different levels of the people you're speaking with. And it has all, you know, a lot to do with the energy that we put out, right? Because we are, I've been teaching this for so long in my Patterson classes. I said, to our essence, we are energy. And the energy that we have is projected out to others and they feel it. And so when you walk into a place of business and they don't like each other, you feel it. And when you walk into a place of business and they all are happy and having a good time together and they love each other, you feel that and that's welcoming and you want to come there. And the other place you think like, I can't wait to get the hell out of this place. These people are all obnoxious. So we have to control our own energy and understand what that brings to the table and that humans naturally mirror each other. And so well, it was, I was going to do a talk for AHA and it was about firing clients. So I just did a little Facebook research with some of my manager groups and I said, okay, tell me why you're firing clients. Give me some reasons why you're firing clients. And so it all boiled down to about 18 different reasons. And I looked at it and I thought, all of these are exactly the same reasons that I had been dealing with upset clients for 30 years working in practice. So the only two new ones were, I don't want to wear a mask and I want to come into the building. So that was the only two things that were different because of COVID. So if we are having, like as you said, these conversations happen over and over and over again in vet med, the same things, the same triggers, then why don't we have strategies for those conversations? Why don't we look at why we're firing clients and why they're upset and make a plan for those things. Um, and I talk about it. I just, I just finished turning in my manuscript for my new book. It's called Hospitality and Healthcare. 
And it's talking about using hospitality skills because I grew up in the restaurant business. And how do you use hospitality skills to make it an inviting place to, um, you know, manage compliance, to actually as a team show hospitality to each other so that it's a welcome place. When new people come in, you know, do you look at them like, you know, they're the unknown devil and that happens a lot, or are you welcoming to them and inviting them to come in? Uh, I can remember my own personal experience coming into the hospital as a new part-time receptionist and one of the um, other receptionists invited me to lunch at her house and made me a grilled cheese sandwich. And that was the tipping point because I didn't really think up until that point because I wasn't being trained. It was just, you know, follow her kind of stuff. Um, and I thought, oh, am I going to be able to handle this? I don't really enjoy this. You know, it's not they're not showing me anything. Um, and then that grilled cheese sandwich changed everything because now I had a friend and a mentor who was going to show me the way. And I felt like I go, could go to Joanne because she had shown me yeah. kindness, right? Yeah, kindness. Like, yeah. you know, you offered every client a bottle of water that could go a long way. And I think, you know, there's, I think, um, I've, I've read that along the way when we talk about um, energy and spirituality and, and even the hospitality of influencing decisions and people in a positive way, um, giving a gift right? Do we give, do we give a gift? If it's not a physical bottle of water, are we offering them a compliment, you know, or are we offering them? I was lucky. Like I said, I spent 11 years at my first practice and they provided us with continuing education that trained us in communication and some of these skills. And that's the beauty. And if we're shifting the conversation of how people can take action is that these are skills anyone can learn at any stage of the game. Exactly. And it will have a direct correlation on your interactions within the hospital and how you have a life in vet med, what your career looks like, what your, um, what your client interactions look like. Like you said, what your team looks like, um, you, you're able to shift out of potentially bitter perspectives that can happen especially for seasoned veter veteran, you know, personnel um, or the fear that comes in for people who are new. Um, and when we look at, gosh, I could talk about energy all day, but um, that's, you know, that's a big game changer for a lot of hospitals and for a lot of people to, to shift how they work with people, um, how they work with their clients and potentially retain not just clients, but attract and retain talent. Um, but it's a, it's a, a conversation like all of it itself. And that's where G Get Motivated University comes in for us. We recognized fairly early on. So if we, we started, we launched the company in, I think, 2018. I'm so happy to, to announce or to celebrate our fifth year anniversary this year. Um, thank you so much. It's like our birthday. I want to yeah. say it's our birthday. And by 2019, a year later, we had developed our online courses because 50 minutes, whether it's a podcast or a CE se session, was just not enough to give people those tools. And also the lunch and learns are not, we'll say enough, like they're great places to start. If you do it routinely, then it's perfect for people to ride the waves. Like when we work with hospitals, it's oftentimes quarterly. Um, but again, you want to customize these things, but it's because you can ride that wave, put these things into practice, come back, fine tune the radio, and then adopt another skill, right? Um, because again, you're priming yourself to be like fertile soil. And if you're getting that place, then when you get that new skill, it doesn't just get rejected. You know, it's almost like, a, I'm going to weird analogy, but like an organ transplant. And you know, like you want to be open and receptive to that rather than knowing that our we're in attack mode, you know, right. because right. these things are the things that are going to be life-saving. And I don't say that lightly. I am so, I am beyond proud of the work that Get Motivated has done and the space and the, when people know who to call in the good times, in the, I want to learn, I'm ready for change times. 
And in sometimes the worst of times, be able to support the teams because it is in fact life-saving. And I'm there, there's no analogy in that. We know that to be true, that through Get Motivated's work, it has saved lives. And there is the plan. The plan is there because that's what happened for Quincy and I was that we didn't just read and regurgitate info. We walked that walk. We have, these are strategies that not only we've used for 10 plus years, these are strategies that the most successful people in the world, the most happy people in the world are using, but also thousands of veterinary professionals every single day, getting the predicted results, right, that we know are going to happen, but then also those freaking bombshells, Debbie, the bombshells when they call you and they've got a better relationship with their kid, they made a promotion, they um, they did something they never thought that they were going to do, they gave a presentation to their team and now four people now have the same skills that they have. These things are, I've got goosebumps just talking about it because I hear these things every single day that their marriage is is different and these people were on the edge of divorce, you know, and these are the things that are important. These are the driving factors that when we get away, when we orbit too far from our core values, and when sometimes you've orbited so far that you don't even know what those are, you are rusted. You, your dream gears are rusted. Your skill gears are rusted. But through Get Motivated and Get Motivated University, we launched the Vet Burnout Prep Certification in 2021. So one year on that, um, graduates moving into level two, these are the things that give people the empowerment, the plan to be not just preventing these things, but becoming resilient when they do, when it, when something does come knocking on your door, when all of a sudden you are taking care of elderly parents and that compounds on you taking care of your young children. When you get into a place where the, the practice that you're in is, is toxic, when it gives you this plan, it gives you a roadmap to where you don't have to figure out the roadmap because if you are stuck in survival mode, man, it's really going to be hard to build a ship and build a life raft. Mm -hmm. You know, but if that roadmap is there, if that, that ship is there and you become that ship to where you can go out to the depths of the ocean and withstand storms, you are no longer that canoe that gets rocked every time there's a little ripple because a little bubble guppy came up blowing some air bubbles. And that's how I felt early on was that the littlest things would send me spiraling and so it was, we'll say the, the perfect recipe to get into those places of, of psychological distress or of burnout, compassion fatigue, where you might get bitter, um, where you, where you encounter these patients that take every last bit of, of energy and emotion that you have. Um, and so these are the things that are there when we get it out into households, when I think about households of vet med, knowing not just where you can tap into those resources, but what can we do as individuals? Because the ship of vet med, the industry of vet med is going to be slow to change. Those systems that you don't have control over, when I'm in those forums, there's so many things that get motivated doesn't have control over they might not have control over and I trust that they are changing I know that they are changing I know that it's hard for them to see that because they're not in the same position that I'm in to see different moves in vet med and we know that stress narrows your view and so but the more that you make that choice to choose to figure it out, to choose to get yourself a legal pad or a notepad and you work and you do the work and you do the work and you're gonna get out of debt. 
you're going to have a better relationship. You're going to get a promotion. You're going to, or you stay, you get to stay in this industry that you love. I'm over 20 years in this industry. You're over 20 years in this industry. The, you don't, if this is where you're passionate, you get to stay here. Right. And you get to sustain here and you get to inspire here and you are going to radiate that. And the, the change, the change for your team is going to be organically infused. It's not going to be something that you have to effort your way to the clinics that I've worked at. Are there still one or two people who I've encountered who might not like Renee? That's possible. Sure. Like there's so much more to our human existence than, but can I positively impact those positions? Yeah. Like I said, my kitty, I was just there the other day and it happened to be one of the clinics that I worked at. And like I, I told you, I met up with one of my colleagues, positive relationship 10 years later to have that conversation. Two of my other colleagues, not just to rely on again in that, that, that world, but the human, hi, hey, how are you? What chapters have changed? What's going on? What are you excited about? You know, those things are there. And those are the things that matter. And that in and of itself is, um, is a tool, is a strategy. Because like you said, your brain is wired to look for these negatives. And if people know anything about sales or reviews, you have to have like five to every one. Mm -hmm. um, so if you aren't putting up post-its, I'd turn you around. I've got seven post-its on my wall. I've got a, multiple files in my filing cabinet. I've got multiple files in my phone. When I'm in that valley and I'm having that low day and some gremlin saying like, Renee, you're not that great. But so-and-so says I am. Uh -huh. So -and -so says I am. And if that you you got to tap into that. Yeah, you got to You got to pay attention to the wins. I, I think that's where we forget when in my practice. And this was, you know, long before I knew all the stuff I know now about brain work and stuff. But we would get thank you notes from clients and I made a, a huge bulletin board. And so these notes were always in the break room. So every time you could come in there, if you were having a bad day, you could sit there and you could read how thankful and grateful and appreciative people were. Now, this was, you know, back long before social media <laughs> was friendly as this is. But I will tell you this, the clinic that I managed for for 19 years, I look um, and they still to this day do not have anything less than a five-star review. Now that clinic has been open since 1968, but it is, everybody there was trained. Many of the people that are there, I hired and I've been gone since 2005. Yeah. So it's the- I've got wipers at my practice too. The culture, you know, is the culture. So we know this stuff works. Not only does it work for your clients and for your pet, but for each other, but it also, like you said, it works at home. And I think that's really important because you can have a great workplace, but if people are living through hell at home, then they've got to bring that to them. You can't separate your work and your home. It never does separate. And you may be the safe haven. The work is the safe haven and the home is the difficult place. But if you can teach skills that help you manage the home too, then you can, you've can. helped the whole person, not just the, the person who's grinding out some production for you. you. You You've helped the whole person. So I think that these skills are so important to teach. And, you know, like I said, I'm so excited that you guys have formalized it and put it into this training program and, I've been um, preaching and teaching about it for years. I talked to Josh Weissman the other day and I said, I'm so glad this is happening because for years I felt like I was the voice crying in the wilderness and other people have now come in going, yes, this is, yes, yes, yes. This is stuff we need to know. And it works. And I have, because I have been in veterinary medicine over 35 years, um, I know what, I know what it can do. I know I've lived in an environment that everybody wants that it we I hate to say the word unicorn, but it's truly it was a unicorn clinic when clients willingly paid. We had a huge compliance rate on preventative care. We were profitable, uh, very profitable. We paid people well. In fact, I paid people better in 2005 than some people are getting paid today. 
And I look and not in the VAs, you know, not I didn't have an RVT because I couldn't find one. So I know that this stuff works and the proof of concept is there in the in the book. I actually go into talking about human medicine because there's studies that when we use hospitality in human medicine, that there is less burnout, there is less turnover, there is a better patient outcome. Patients actually comply. And so we have data points that prove this stuff, not just you know, we feel better, but there's facts that say we are profitable. We make more money. Our staff is better paid. Um, and so it, it, you know, all ships rise when we do this. Um, well, Renee, gosh, we could, I know what we could talk about this for like five hours and people would probably lose their mind, but, um, let's, let's just wrap up any final words of wisdom. Do you have a fun fact to have a secret talent, favorite song, Something people would be surprised to know. Fun fact. Um, favorite song. Right now, I'm really enjoying the Bahamas band. Love their like chill vibes. And then like on my rock side, it's um, Imagine Dragons has been for a long time. I love alternative rock. Okay. But, you know, when I think about music for a long time, I used to listen to oldies when I would do like chores or um, things like that around the house. And I, I'm sure that it comes from my home, you know, like listening to that music when I was younger. Um, but the, it's just so, you know, uplifting. I don't know. Music, I think, is it's one of those tools that you can tap into. And again, there's going to be a flood of chemicals um, that put you one way or the other. And if you use that as a tool, like meditation, music, um, finding things like binaural beats to help you like shift what's happening in the physiology, you know, hack your physiology. Um, that's something I think is, is open, you know, these topics are mainstream. If you're ready for that, if you're ready to have a different experience in life, you can do it. Like that's, you have the ability. I can't make that choice for you. I think we have to give ourselves that permission, but if you have to borrow someone's permission, borrow ours, we're giving you permission to go pee today. Absolutely. Anything you would like to say about how to reach out to the company um, so that people can get in touch with you, or if you have a favorite book or a favorite quote. Yes. Oh my goodness. The quotes are just endless. Um, I'm looking at Steve Jobs quotes. It says, you know, here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square hole, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of the rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify them or vilify them about the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see, <laughs> I know. I know. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And Debbie, I think that's you and me. I think that's all of us. That's our job. That is our job. You know, we, my husband's like, when are you going to retire? And I went, I'm not done yet. I'm not done with the work that I need to do. And there's too much work to, to stop. So um, I appreciate what you're doing. I really, I cannot tell you enough how important it is. And um, as always, if I can help make change for the positive, um, I'm in your corner. So shout out to you. Shout out to Quincy. He's been on before too. So people have gotten a double dose of getting motivated. <laughs> well, thank you for having me on. Of course, we're on all of, you know, the social media channels, the website, I can send links over to you for your oh, audience members.com and get motivateduniversity.com. If people want to reach out individually, I'll send my email address. That's a great way to reach out one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but join us, join our community, um, you know, and just just connect, connect. There's so many like-minded professionals who are supporting each other. And that's the magic. That's the magic that I'm really proud of beyond the individual results is that I just led a cohort this spring. And now these women um, in this cohort, there was just when we've got plenty of men in our community. So guys don't, don't think that you're not he seen and heard. Um, but it just happened to be 
anyway. So these people had their, they've got their connections. They've sparked this magic within each other. They're supporting each other on a non-digital level. You know, they've got human connection. Um, and so they're there. People who, um, who find that well-being matters are there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, thank you once again. And thank you uh, for all of those who listened to this podcast. I hope you found it as interesting and motivating as I did. And um, that you will heed this advice and take the advantage of the tools that are available out there because they do make your life better and they make life better for the animals that we serve and for the people around us. And it is so important that we bring people back into our profession rather than bleeding people out of our profession as, as what we are having, having happen right now. So thank you all again. This is Debbie Boone for this episode of The Bend. We will have all Renee's information in the show notes.